during these few minutes of silence, you can focus on something you're grateful for or someone you're remembering, especially today, or something you're mourning, or even just the pace of your breath. Will you find a comfortable place in your seat and take a few easy breaths as we settle into this shared silence together? Amen. Friends, will you pray with me? Spirit of life, God of many names and no name at all, hear our prayer. The nation cries out, and we hear the echoes even here in our own city, in our own hearts. For those who are tear gassed, may the burning be eased. For those who are hit with rubber bullets, may the sting be soothed. For those who are beaten with police batons, may the ache subside quickly. For those who use their authority to hurt others, may they know there is another way. For those who lie awake in fear, may they be comforted. For those who feel powerless, may they find a way forward. For those who seek the truth, may they be guided by righteousness and love. For those who feel alone, may they be surrounded by care and company. For all those who mourn, may they know the depth of love. For those who mourn unjust and preventable death, may they know their rage is holy. We ask these things for ourselves, for those we love, and for those we do not love. 
Amen. reading this morning comes to us from the poet William Blake. Joy and woe are woven fine, clothing for the soul divine. Under every grief and pine runs a joy with silken twine. It is right it should be so. We were made for joy and woe. And when this we rightly know, safely through the world we go. That line, safely through the world we go, sounds different to my ears after last night. After the protests downtown all day that went late into the night. After texts from some of you who were there, who were looking for each other, keeping each other company, watching each other's kids. safely through the world we go. It rings a little hollow, Mr. Blake. There was a moment last night after the reports of rubber bullets being fired by police into the crowd, after the tear gassing or the pepper spraying, where I was about 30 seconds away from hopping in my car and going full soccer mom and driving downtown and chauffeuring all of you home. And we woke up this morning to some headlines, some of which state first, the breaking of windows. The rumors of fires and the reports of fires. The destruction of property. As Unitarian Universalists, we believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person, not of every job, not of every building, not of every window, not of every business, every human being. Our faith shapes how we understand the world and its complications. 
And so we never ever equate or compare the destruction of property to the destruction of black life. Hold that truth close to your heart. Keep that always on your tongue. No human being is expendable. Black lives matter. Remember that the economy in which we live requires us all to believe and behave as if some people do not deserve to live safely or live well. Remember that the prosperity of this nation is ill-gotten, built by stolen people on stolen land. Remember that systems of governance fade in and out. Remember that empires rise and fall, but there are some truths that endure. We depend on each other. We need each other. The world around us, the glories in the world around us demand to be enjoyed. Life, though it is filled with joy and woe, is a gift. And so what blasphemy, what utter desecration of the holiness of human life to ever, ever compare black lives to burning buildings or smashed up windows. It doesn't matter what glass was broken. It matters who is tear gassed. It matters who is hit with rubber bullets. It matters whose murder sparked the protests in the first place. It matters who disproportionately is dying of COVID. It matters who gets assistance and who feels safe. Those are the things that matter, but it does not matter how much money the breaking of the window costs. Windows can be replaced. Human beings can never be replaced. Wherever you are personally in your relationship with the police, in your, um, in your fear or in your reliance, in your understanding of the history of police forces, Wherever you are politically, there is a spiritual question at the center of all of these concerns. And our spiritual question, the question for us as religious people, is to seek what is holy. And the first thing we know, our first principle, is that every human life is holy. And so that is the place where we start when we consider how to engage with what's going on around us. Every human life is holy. And in particular, this week, we remember that black lives are holy. I don't use the word blasphemy a lot. It's not a word that Unitarian Universalists use a lot. It has to do with um, with, the, with the spiritual violation when you speak incorrectly about what is holy. And Unitarian Universalists have um, many, many names for God and for the sacred among us. We don't agree on all the same ones. We don't believe that we need to use the same language for the sacred in order to know it and name it and worship together. But the word blasphemy is about a spiritual violation of the sacred. And so if ever, if ever you see in the news, you hear in conversation, if it rises up to your own tongue, the idea that the primary concern in a protest might be the destruction of property. This is a blasphemy of the highest order. And we ought to do everything we can to uproot it and to turn again to our first principle, to the truth that human beings have inherent worth and dignity and property does not. The role of the church is among other things to equip the faithful 
to reckon with the challenges of our age. And we do that in a lot of ways. We do that through good company. We do that through facilitating connection. We do that through reflecting on spiritual practices and sharing food when we're lucky enough to be in person together. We do that through gathering week after week, year after year, to speak aloud our joys and our sorrows. It's really important that they don't cancel each other out. You may have heard the guidance to look at the world with the glass half full. And especially on days like today, when we are so afraid, when the racist violence and the escalation by the police against nonviolent protesters is coming to a head, when we fear for ourselves and for our loved ones, The idea that there is a glass half full is insulting. The great sorrows of the world are not soothed by an attitude adjustment. The balm for the great sorrows of the world and our own lives is not an attitude adjustment. For the small things, for the petty concerns, the inconveniences and the setbacks, for ease of moving around your life with a little more grace, I offer you the glass half full. But for the big things, for the enormous difficulties and sorrows and tragedies for the great joys and the things that render life sweet and worth living. Imagine two jars, they're separate, jars of joy and woe, woven fine, as the poet says. We don't counteract each other. We don't pursue spiritual lives that are actually just bean counting. We do not hurriedly list our joys in order to dilute or counteract our sorrows. We strive to live full lives of meaning and purpose. And so we name both intense dim dimensions. We were made for joy and woe, says the poet. Two jars. The rush to skip over the sorrow, to skip over the rage, to move past the hurt. Especially, especially when it's given a religious or a spiritual frame. It's called spiritual bypassing. There's a name for what happens when you are in deep mourning and what is suggested to you when you have voiced your sorrow or your grief or your rage is that you should just focus on the things you're grateful for. This is called spiritual bypassing and it arises from the urge to resolve tension, to make the unmanageable feel manageable. And it happens because we quiver in the face of loss and brutality. It happens because so rarely are we granted the space to actually process and reckon with our own sorrows and fears. We crave resolution. This is normal and this is natural, but it is rare to be found. And so instead of trying to wrestle down the mysteries, instead of trying to wrap up nicely the rage and the sorrow all around us, to try to blend that somehow with the fact that the sun has come out and some of us are going on walks with friends. We had a good day in 
in, instead of trying to make sense of the dissonance, they offer you the discipline of the two jars, the attempt to sit with the dissonance. And so in the woe jar, filled perhaps with stone and ash and blood and water, especially this week, the preventable deaths, the American machine of police brutality, the fears and the terror of black people, the violence that protects and ups, up, upholds a status quo. Over and over politics and profits before people, those precious people that COVID has taken from us, the dreams that have died, the childhoods we deserved but didn't get, the people we fear we may never hold again, those we love who are gone, the cruelties we visit upon one another, the ache in our hearts for the dead, the fear that our sanity is slipping from us. Let us not profane the great tragedies, most especially the ones that did not have to be so, nor the ones that result from great evil by skipping over our mourning, small and large. There is room in the woe jar for your feelings of rage about the catastrophic violence all over our country and for your own terrible day. When you are ready, the joy jar waits for you. Filled with clear water, good soil, tiny growing things, the smell after a storm, Before somebody became a hashtag, they loved, they touched lives, knew themselves beloved upon the earth, sat in the sun and enjoyed it. In the joy jar, the preciousness of every moment with the people we love, the ways that we dare to dream, the longings for life and love that surface in us the beauty in the world, the astonishing goodness of people sometimes, the power of unbreakable solidarity, the blessings that catch you by surprise, the days or the hours that are inexplicably lovely, the times and the textures of our days that we savor, the delights we hold on to as if our lives depended on it the extraordinary fullness of living, even in these quarantine days. And above all, a reminder that joy never begins. Well, at least it wasn't worse. Or those other people have it worse than me. Or what do I have to complain about? Joy is not bean counting. Joy is not only dependent on circumstance. As the old spiritual says, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Your joy sneaks up on you, surprises you, overcomes you. You can slow down and look for it. You can notice it and savor it. You can even write it down. But you do not have to skip over your deep sorrow and your rage and your joy won't mind. It will wait until you're ready. We do not pursue spiritual lives where we measure out our luck and our privileges or our misfortune and our oppression and count up all the beans and see if life is on balance good enough to be enjoyed. We just know, as the poet says, 
the joy and woe are woven fine. And the fullness of living each of our precious human lives has much to do with making room for them both. May it be so for you and so for us all. Amen. It is in that spirit that we'll sing our closing hymn together. This is a hymn of thanks. And if you are not ready today to sing a hymn of thanks, that's okay. Because the hymns of thanks will be there for you when you are. 